Hello, everyone. Welcome back to Fair Voice. I'm your host, Hannah Syriac. I'm excited to be with you today. So we're going to talk for a second about the new name. So the new name is going to be FAIR, which stands for Faithful Answers, Informed Response. One of the aspects of changing the name definitely has to do with President Nelson's counsel about not using the word Mormon to uh, self-identify. So we're taking that into account. But there's one section written by Scott Gordon about the new directions of FAIR that I think is really important for us to read and be aware of. He says, the message of the restored gospel of Jesus Christ proclaims Jesus lives, and we are all children of our heavenly father. As President Nelson said, in the garden of Gethsemane, our savior took upon himself every pain, every sin, and all of the anguish and suffering ever experienced by you and me and by everyone who has ever lived or will live. The word Everyone indicates member, non-member, and former member. It includes people who are happy with the church or people who are unhappy with the church. Bickering over some point of doctrine will not bring us any closer to him. We are not stepping away from fact-checking or defending the church. Indeed, we embrace it fully. We just want to do it in the way that we believe the Savior would approve, where we visualize every participant as a child of God. Especially at this time of year, as we celebrate the atonement and resurrection of Jesus Christ, we are reminded that we want to live our lives as his disciples. We will do our best to do this as we provide faithful answers and give informed responses. I love this framing by Scott Gordon. I think this is a really great way to direct FAIR. I support it fully and I am really grateful for the introspection of the FAIR board as they are trying to guide us in the best way that we can to understand FAIR and understand how to give answers. Please keep in mind that our URL will now be fairlatterdaysaints.org. That is fairlatterdaysaints.org. We wanted to drop Mormon entirely in order to, you know, obey the prophetic counsel to not use Mormon as a self-identifier. With that being said, let's talk a bit about today's episode. So today's episode is going to be on murder among the Mormons. I'm just going to tell you a, a bit about it before we get started. But before that, <laughs> um, there was a question asked to me that I wanted to answer. Um, so the question was, how do you prepare for General Conference? General Conference is April 3rd and April 4th this year. I'm very excited for General Conference. You know, since there's a week left, I'll do. You, I'll give you my week preparation because I don't think it makes sense to tell you what I've been doing for the last six months at this point. The way that I prepare for General Conference the week before is I make sure that I read one talk every single day the week before conference. I also try to review my goals from last conference. I review my notes from last conference. I see how I changed from the conference to conference. I, I like to do goals based on religious events. So I have weekly goals, sacrament to sacrament. I have goals from temple trip to temple trip, goals from conference to conference, goals from ordinance to ordinance too. Um, and I think that that's a really effective way of setting goals for me. So I like to look at those goals and review them, especially my conference goals. I find it's a really good time to do that. Something else that I really like to do is to review my study from the directions of prophets and apostles. So President Nelson told us to study covenants and how God will gather Israel with covenants and things like that. And I was able to engage in the study with on covenants and the gathering of Israel. And it was really intriguing for me. I learned a lot from it. It was one of the best studies that I've ever done. So I intend to review my notes on that this week. I also attend, intend to spend about five to 10 minutes a day, every single day, pondering what I want to learn, what I want to do to grow in the future, what I want to you know, change about myself to become more like my Savior, Jesus Christ. So that's what I intend to do for preparing for General Conference. I also like to make note packets. I really like to have an organized way to take notes so that way I can be very effective when I do that. I also like to make sure that I have, you know, my groceries bought. I like to make sure that my apartment's clean. I like to just make sure that my life feels like it's in order so I can really devote that time and that energy to listening to my prophets and apostles speak. I find that that's really important for me. I like to do as much homework as I can before the weekend. I luckily finished my homework that is due next Monday already, so I shall be good on that. Those are a few things that I like to do, and I would love to hear from you. What do you do to prepare for General Conference? Feel free to email me, free, free to let me know in some way. You can find me on social media. Let me know how you prepare for conference. I would love to know. 
Let's talk for a second about murder among the Mormons before we talk to Richard Turley. Um, Richard Turley is amazing. It was a very great interview. I was very happy to record it. So Murder Among the Mormons is a Netflix documentary that came out on March 3rd, 2021. So Jared Hess and Taylor, Tyler Meesom, and you'll know the name Jared Hess. You should know the name Jared Hess. So Jared Hess was the director of uh, Napoleon Dynamite, which was a very interesting movie. I understand that a lot of Latter-day Saints really like that movie. Not really my favorite movie, but a lot of Latter-day Saints love that movie. And also, I believe the movie Nacho Libre, too. Um, so Jared has pretty funny dude. Um, so he and Tyler Meesom directed Murder Among the Mormons that began filming and recording interviews in 2017, which was incredible. And then they spent the next few years engaging in this work, trying to figure out who Mark Hoffman was. They do a really great job of balancing interviews. So you see a lot of different characters appear in the Netflix documentary. So I, I feel like it's worth watching for the reason that it's balanced, but also I want to be able to do this episode so that if you have watched it and you have some questions, hopefully we'll answer some of your questions in the episode. But I will say, if you have any questions about the documentary, if you have any questions about um, a- any of the Mark Hoffman case, please feel free to email me and I will try my best to get to them. I get a lot of emails sometimes, so I might be a little bit slow, but nudge me a couple times if I don't respond. <laughs> So let's talk for a second about who Mark Hoffman is, and we'll talk more about him. I just wanted to provide some biographical information for you. So Mark Hoffman was born in 1954. He was born into the church, so he was a Latter-day Saint. He did not really do that well in school, um, but he forged coins, and and Turley talks about this. He forged coins as a young teenager. Um, He told Brent Metcalf, I believe, that at age 14 he had become an atheist, um, but he still remained in name only an active member of the church. Um, he appeared to be active outside of that. Um, so he was a very interesting person for several reasons. Um, and he was really bothered by polygamy. He was bothered by, um, no man knows my history by Von Brody. Um, he was bothered by a lot of these things and eventually he got into the documents business. When he got into the documents business, it was not like most people getting into the documents business. So most people get into the documents business obviously to collect and sell documents. I have some old documents. I love collecting old documents. Um, but he got into the documents business for a different reason. He got in to create forgeries. For a lot of people who do forgeries, forgeries are sort of the byproduct of being in the document industry most of the time, not exactly the intention of being in the document industry. So just keep that in mind. That's a very interesting fact about Mark Hoffman. Mark Hoffman ended up murdering people over his documents, which is very deeply, deeply disturbing to me, very sad. And I would just like to caution you, we don't talk about anything graphic or anything explicit, um, but the violence that he did commit is mentioned throughout this episode. But with that being said, I would love to transition right into it. Let me know if you have any questions. I'll do something on General Conference because I always think that's really fun. I'll figure out something amazing that we can talk about with General Conference. I'll give you a little bit of a rundown. But with no further ado, let's talk about Murder Among the Mormons. Today we are going to talk about Murder Among the Mormons, and I have with me here today Richard Turley. Could you please introduce yourself, tell us who you are and what you do? So I'm Richard E. Turley Jr. As far as the Mark Hoffman case is concerned, probably the most relevant information is that I wrote the 1992 book, Victims, the LDS Church and the Mark Hoffman Case, which I've recently reissued with an afterword. Awesome. Thanks for letting us know that. I'm so excited to talk today. Um, So Murder Among the Mormons is a new Netflix documentary that talks about the Mark Hoffman case. Some of our listeners might not know who Mark Hoffman is and that scandal. Uh, Could you please provide some background information on who Mark Hoffman is and what he did, what the scandal was? Sure. In 1980, Mark Hoffman was a medical a pre-med student at Utah State University, and then purported to discover a document that was an early document from the history of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, actually a document that precedes the organization of the church, a document that was called the Anthon Transcript. This purported to be the very document that Martin Harris took to Charles Anthon in order to have the Book of Mormon characters reviewed by a scholar. 
Uh, the document was received by the public with considerable amount of acclaim. It was uh, subjected to a number of evaluations by experts who declared it to be authentic. And that began uh, Mark Hoffman's most public presence. He, he Actually, he was in business long before that, but with the Anthem transcript, he began deciding that he wanted to sell documents full-time. And so he quit his his uh, day work, which was being a student, and went to work as a full-time document dealer. His document dealing essentially ended in October of 1985 when three bombs went off in Salt Lake City. The first two killed Stephen F. Christensen, who had purchased one of Hoffman's documents. The second killed uh, Kathy Sheets, who was the wife of Christensen's business partner, and the third injured but did not kill Mark Hoffman. Over the next year and a half, investigators looked carefully to try to figure out what the motive was for murder and ultimately determined that the motive was that Mark Hoffman was not actually discovering the documents he claimed to discover, he was forging them, and that he had murdered people in order to cover up his forgeries and be able to buy more time for himself. He'd overextended himself financially by promising people documents and getting payment for them before he took the time to forge them. So that became known as the Mark Hoffman case. It was a very prominent case, not only in Utah, but in national and international news, uh, particularly from 1985 to 1987 when Hoffman pled guilty and went to prison where he remains to this day. What types of documents did uh, Mark Hoffman forge outside of the Anthem transcript? He forged a number of documents relating to the history of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, but he didn't limit himself to Latter-day Saint church history. In fact, he forged a lot of documents pertaining to the history of the United States of America, pertaining to literary history and other things. Wherever he could get money, he forged documents. One of the most famous documents that he forged is the Salamander Letter. Could you talk to us about what the Salamander letter is, and also what the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints' reaction to discovering that the Salamander letter existed was. Mark Hoffman purport, purported to find a letter in the handwriting of Martin Harris that gave a much different description of the discovery of the gold plates of the Book of Mormon than had traditionally been taught by the church. According to this Salamander letter, purportedly in Martin Harris's hands, it was not the angel Moroni who showed the plates to Joseph Smith, it was a white salamander. And of course, when that letter came out, it generated a lot of interest. One of Mark Hoffman's associates offered the letter to the church, to President Gordon B. Hinckley, then a member of the First Presidency. He took one look at the letter, had doubts about its authenticity and declined to purchase it. It then went to Stephen F. Christensen, the victim of Mark Hoffman's first bomb, and Christensen spent a lot of time and money having the document authenticated, and then he donated it to the church. Not long after he donated it to the church, the church published it along with a statement from President Hinckley in which he said, we'll have to accept the conclusions of the document examiners for the present that the document is authentic, but that does not mean it could not have been a forgery from a long time ago. But it disturbed a lot of people because it told a much different story of the origins of the church than they had heard before. Uh, some people uh, had that document become the basis of a change in their, in their beliefs. I know of one person who committed suicide over that letter. I mean, it created a lot of concern, not only among uh, members of the church, but also among people who were friends of members of the church. What about the Joseph Smith third blessing document? How did that play into this? After the discovery of the Anthem transcript, Mark Hoffman's next major find, the one that gathered a lot of attention, was a purported uh, blessing document from Joseph Smith Jr. to Joseph Smith III. The reorganized Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, known today usually under the title Community of Christ, had a longstanding tradition that Joseph Smith Jr., designated his son Joseph Smith III as his successor. This document that Hoffman claimed to discover was the first real solid documentation of that tradition. And so it, it again, generated a lot of uh, news coverage. So Mark Hoffman was an active member at this time, is that correct? He was a returned missionary. He was married in the temple. 
And so for all intents and purposes, his public persona seemed to be that of an active church member. In reality, he had lost his faith many years earlier, and he had turned to forgery as a way of doing three things. One, making a living. Two, defying authority because he didn't like authority figures of any kind. And three, changing the history of the church. That's a really good point. I think I remember hearing that he said that he lost his faith at around age 14, um, which would have been significantly before he went on, on a mission. So did anyone suspect that these documents were forgeries at the time, or did it come as a shock um, before the bombings case? Yes. In fact, I'd encourage people to read my book, Victims, the LDS Church and the Mark Hoffman Case, because it's really the only book that takes you from the very beginning and trickles out the information to you in the same way it would have been trickled out to people at the time and helps you understand that as his documents came out one by one, they were subjected to testing by various people who looked at them from a historical standpoint, who looked at the paper, who looked at the handwriting, who looked at the ink and so forth. And despite doubts people had about their authenticity, the documents kept coming back from experts certified as being authentic. So after that happens a few times, people just sort of throw their arms in the air and say, well, they must be authentic because they're tested by the experts and they come back uh, consistently as being designated authentic. I think for a lot of individuals, some of these documents that we've been talking about seem like they come out of left field. Um, but for example, with the white salamander letter, could you talk about why there was a white salamander as a possibility, the origins of this white salamander, if that makes sense. So Hoffman was not only a, a, quite a skilled forger, he was also a very skilled con man. And so he looked at his potential buyers who included people who were active members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints and the entire spectrum, including those who were antagonistic towards the church. And he tried to create documents that would stir controversy and also be seen by people along that spectrum as potentially being authentic. So he would take a real historical circumstance and twist it so that when it was examined by experts, they would say, oh, he would not have known about this particular circumstance. And the fact that this letter references that must mean that it's authentic. Or he would do other things that would make people think it was authentic at the same time. And this is where the, the con man presence that came in at the same time, he maintain this persona of being just sort of a uh, happy-go-lucky, not very intelligent uh, man who was out discovering documents. And therefore, when he presented them to experts, those experts thought that he would not have had enough understanding and expertise himself to make up what was in the letters or other documents. That makes perfect sense that he kind of um, created this narrative about himself to combat the forgeries that he was doing. One question that I had that came to mind when we were talking um, is I can't imagine how shocking it would be as a church member to see these documents come out one by one and have each one feel like a, a bit of a trial of faith. Could you talk a bit more about people's experiences at that time and what the church did to mitigate those experiences? Sure. Hoffman's documents were actually all over the board. Some of his documents appeared to affirm traditional stories. Others appeared to go against it. Uh, he had a long-term goal of forging the 116 lost pages of the Book of Lehi, the Book of Mormon manuscript. And so he, he was aiming everything in that direction with the goal of having that document be dramatically different from the way uh, we assume today it would have been. So as his documents came out, some four seemed to be uh, confirming the traditional uh, story of the church's history, others against it. People reacted in different ways. Those who sort of stood back and looked at the big picture, I think, looked at those and said, well, these are these are anomalies. Over time, anomalies tend to work themselves out or just sort of sit outside the normal, you know, ba balanced uh, bulk of data. Others tended to react very strongly to individual documents. As I said, some people lost their faith over a single document. I know of one suicide that occurred directly as a result of that. So Hoffman's forgeries did a lot of damage to people's individual lives. So how were these documents authenticated? Um, because we know now that he forged a ton of documents, but could you talk a bit more about how Hoffman was able to forge documents in a way that basically um, deceives people into thinking that they were true? Sure. He started his forgery career as a, 
a, a youth. He had a chemistry set, burned himself, and while he was recuperating from the burning, his his uh, parents gave him a coin collecting sleeve. I think many of us have used these when we were children. You know, they're these fold up coin collecting sleeves, and they have little slots for all the coins. And you just look at all the coins in your in your possession and see if you can fit them into the slots. So he quickly recognized that there were a lot of coins that were difficult to find in circulation. And so because he had a chemistry set, which is what he burned himself with, he decided that he would play around with the coins. Uh, for example, and this is something that he did, if you collect coins and you collect mercury dimes, which are the early dimes of the 20th century, you'll recognize that it is possible to find at least it was in those days, find a 1916 mercury dime in circulation, but extremely difficult to impossible to find the 1916D mercury dime because that was extremely rare. So he got out his chemistry set and he had a little electroplating mechanism and he electroplated a D on a 1916 dime that ended up going to a certifying agency and came back saying, yes, this is an authentic coin. So at that point in his teens, he realized, you know, I can make money with my skills. So he graduated from coins eventually to collecting Latter-day Saint coins, uh, which included paper money that was sometimes printed, sometimes in manuscripts, sometimes had signatures. So he began to practice doing signatures of church leaders and then migrated from there to entire documents and, and the purported handwriting of church leaders. At the same time, he was checking out books and reading books on how you detect forgeries. And he knew that one of the things that was used to detect forgeries is aging of the paper. So he would go into libraries and using a blade would cut out the end sheets of old books so that when the paper was tested, it would certify as being old paper. He got a recipe for old ink and he used that recipe. So when it was tested, it would come up with the right formula, which is not a formula we use today. On his most elaborate forgery, he took very old paper and burned it put the ashes of that in his ink recipes so that even the dating of that ink would come out properly. His, his uh, forgeries were primitive in, at some periods of time when he didn't spend a lot of time. In fact, there were people who would say to him, oh, that's, that's an obvious forgery. And keeping this sort of a public image of not being very sophisticated, he would mm -hmm. say in his squeaky voice, oh, uh, I guess that I'll have to take that back to the person who sold it to me and get my money back. So he would learn from his mistakes and people didn't suspect him because his documents kept getting tested and come out all right. So ultimately, um, when he was the victim of the third bomb, there were people who thought he was a true victim, not the setter of the bombs. And he had his defenders from October of 1985 when he was bombed himself clear until January of 87 when he pled guilty. And many of his best defenders were those who were the experts who thought, no, this man could possibly have the sophistication to create these kinds of things. That makes sense. And I, I think that that's a really interesting point that he would kind of use trial and error in order to create um, forgeries. I didn't, I didn't know that. That's very fascinating. One um, other forgery that I want to talk about before transitioning into talking about the documentary itself and some of the reactions to the documentary um, is Oath of a Freeman. Could you talk a little bit about Oath of a Freeman? Because that is a very fascinating document to try to forge, in my opinion. Um, that would be a very difficult one to, to pull off. So Mark Hoffman was essentially, over time, engaged in a big Ponzi scheme, meaning that he would take money that he got from one buyer that supposedly was to go for a document and he would use that to pay off a debt he'd already incurred. And so his debt kept getting larger and larger and larger until he was you know, looking at seven digits worth of expenditures, uh, which is a lot by today's standard, but was even more back in the 1980s. And so he kept thinking of bigger and bigger forgeries that he could do. And so he ultimately landed on what he thought to be his great forgery before the 116 pages, and that is to forge the earliest printed document in America, which was the Oath of a Freeman. That document he knew would be subjected to a lot of tests by highly sophisticated people. So he went to a lot of work to create it. He stole paper that would date approximately to the period of the document. Then he burned some of that paper to put in his ink formula. And he, he studied the type very, very carefully and created a document that 
the document plate that he could use to print this on period paper with ink that had period paper inside the ink recipe. And then he artificially aged it using a technique that he had developed. So he, he felt that all of those things together would make it come out testing authentic if it were ever tested. And in fact, it was tested quite uh, in quite sophisticated ways, including through a cyclotron test. And until the bombings, there were still a lot of people who said, well, I think it's authentic. I think it's authentic. And he wanted to sell it for $1.5 million so he could cover all of the debts that he had. But the people who could have bought it, the Library of Congress, and uh, was the main target for it, and others began to drag their feet. They weren't quite certain. I mean, you know, it's the likelihood of finding it. He claimed that he was in a bookstore in New York and was going through a, a file of just flat pieces of paper that had printing on them and came across this item, pulled it out because he thought it was interesting, then did some research and discovered it was the earliest printed document in America. And in fact, there are a lot of books who talk about this document, give what the text is going to be. And so he had actually prepared it in advance, planted it, pulled it out, and then claimed that he had discovered it. Um, very sophisticated story that's potentially you know, accurate, but it was taking so long to authenticate it and find a purchaser that his financial pressures built. A lot of his debtors began putting pressure on him. And like all con men, you know, he just needed another hour, another day, another week, or another month to come up with the money to pay off the next person on the Ponzi scheme. And it just didn't work. So he planted the bombs to buy himself more time. Was there any suspicion about him finding these documents? Because he was claiming to find a lot of early American documents and a lot of early church documents that had signatures on them and things like that. Was there any suspicion amongst the community about that? From the very beginning, as I said, read, if you read my book, Victims, the LDS Church of the Markov case, you'll, you'll discover that even with his very first one, which seemed to confirm a story in church history, that people were saying, yeah, yeah, I mean, how, how could he come up with that? And so people did genealogical research on the Bible that supposedly he found it and it came from a Smith family member. They did other evaluations. They, you know, the handwriting experts looked at it and so forth, but nobody could find anything that said it's a forgery. So over time, they just sort of shrugged their shoulders. The second big one, the Joseph Smith Third Blessing, that was evaluated by forensic document experts that had looked at hundreds of thousands of documents. And they looked at it and said, no, this one appears to be authentic. So it was the certification by experts over time that created the reputation for him. Plus, once he became known as a document dealer, people traded authentic material to him or he purchased authentic material. So he had a lot of authentic things passed through his hands and sort of became the go-to person when it came to things like that. But yes, there was suspicion from the beginning, uh, but nobody could find any evidence. In fact, even after the bombings, even after the bombings, when forensic document examiners who were looking for a motive for murder first looked at the documents, they could not find out anything wrong with them. They persisted because they were looking for motive for a murder. Had there been no murders, they likely would have looked at them and thought, you know, on first glance, they appear to be authentic. But it was the fact that there'd been murders and they needed to persist and find motive for murder that caused them eventually to find the flaw in Hoffman's system, which allowed them to identify Hoffman forgeries. One line from the documentary that has really stood out to me was, um, I forget who said it, but someone's, uh, I think it was Mark Hoffman actually who said it, that he entered the forging, sorry, he entered the document business to forge documents not to find any real ones and finding real ones was sort of incidental to what he was doing. And I just thought that that was really different compared to how most other people got involved in forging documents. Um, so how did you get involved with the documentary series Murder and the Mormons? And have you been able to watch the full series yet? So the way I got involved was I had written a, a book published in 1992 by, by uh, University of Illinois Press, Victims, the LDS Church and the Mark Hoffman case. So when the, the filmmakers got started, they visited me in my office. I was then the uh, managing director of public affairs for the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And they came to me in my office, visited me and said they would like my cooperation, which I was happy to grant to them. I knew a lot about the case. They said they wanted to interview me. I'd say I'd be happy to do that. Uh, and then I helped them, you know, with other requests that they had over time. So they interviewed me. Um, you know, this interview probably occurred uh, a couple of years ago, maybe. Uh, 
Uh, that, and so eventually they completed their, their Netflix piece. Uh, they, they kept me aware when it was coming out. Uh, when it came out, my wife and I binge watched it. The, you know, we got up early in the morning and binge watched it as soon as it, it was released. And then uh, later that week, uh, one of my children had a watch party and I watched it a second time all the way through. So yes, I've seen it twice all the way through. Awesome, yeah. When it came out, I also binge watched it, and I, I think I've seen it four times since uh -huh. it came out. It's so it's such an interesting documentary, and I was grateful for a lot of the ways that um, things were portrayed. But we wanted to take this time to kind of clarify some concerns that members might have after watching the documentary. One of the biggest concerns that I've seen is members have talked about how um, they feel like the church hid documents from the public and the church didn't respond to this situation adequately. So could, how would you respond to someone who would say that the church had documents? Again, it's easy for me to say as an author, but really you need to read the book. The, the, a lot of people are jumping to conclusions based on a very summary amount of information about various aspects of this. But as is so often the case, the real information is in the details. So I would encourage you to immerse yourselves in the details of what's going on particularly read my book. You don't have to buy it. Go, go to a library. There are a lot of copies in libraries, particularly if you live in Utah. But to get a copy of the book, borrow it from a friend or whatever, and just read it from cover to cover if you really want to understand what was going on at the time. Yeah, and I'll be sure to link your book in the description and provide some library information too. So the ISBN number with that, um, that'll be helpful. One other concern that um, individuals brought up was about um, sort of the ability of church leaders to discern whether or not these documents were authentic. There's been some talk about how prophets and apostles can't possibly be prophets and apostles if they are not able to detect forged documents when they first come out. You did talk a little bit about this in the documentary itself. You responded right after um, Sandra Tanner made her comments about that, um, but I'd love to hear you say the same response and maybe expand a little bit about that situation and what it would have been like for prophets and apostles at that time. Sure. I think two main points. One is that a lot of church members assume infallibility for church leaders, which is something they don't claim for themselves. And I think one of the biggest challenges people have is how do you deal with infallibility? Uh, my answer to that question is there are two parts of being a believing Latter-day Saint. One, of course, is listening to church leaders, but the other one is making your own choice based upon uh, receiving your own personal uh, inspiration about something. If, you, if all you do is blindly follow a leader, you're not exercising your agency well. So I, I think it's important for people to realize there's two parts to that equation. One is listening to church leaders, and the other is then making your decision based on your feelings about all of that. Uh, so it's, a, it's sort of a it's a responsibility not only to follow a church leader, but to get your own personal um, feeling about the rightness of doing that. Does that make sense? Second, as part of this uh, idea of infallibility, some people assume that a church leader will always be able to detect something that's, that's wrong. And that's simply not true. The Lord does not intervene to, to uh, prevent all evil. Uh, there's a passage in the Doctrine and Covenants related to the last 116 pages that I use to begin one of the parts of my book. And it's part one. And the passage is basically says that you, you, you cannot tell, you cannot distinguish between uh, the person who's doing right and the person who's doing wrong. You know, um, simply I'm not gonna tell you in every case. Can a church leader discern that? Sometimes from time to time, but God is not going to abrogate somebody's agency by telling them every time what's going on. Otherwise, you know, you're, you're interfering with, with people's agency. So essentially what I said on the, on the documentary was that the theological principle is that God's not going to intervene in order to prevent all of those kinds of things. So when, when, the, when that passage says you cannot tell, you know, the righteous from the wicked, um, I think that's a, that's a statement that Church leaders will sometimes be deceived by those who are trying to do wrong. If somebody walks into a temple recommend interview and lies, uh, will a church leader be able to detect that? Sometimes they have feelings. I'll tell you from my perspective, as someone who's done temple recommend interviews, there are times when I've had people approach me and I ask them a question and I just have a feeling in my gut it's not true, but they said it's not true. But if they represent themselves as 
being worthy, and I have no concrete evidence to the contrary, I cannot um, interfere with with that. And you know, the Lord isn't always going to make it possible for church leaders to know um, who's lying and who's not, who's who's fooling them and who's not. It's just it's just not part of how it operates. So I think if you have that notion, you need to um, abandon that in favor of the principle of agency. I appreciate that answer a lot. I do think that that's one of the key elements to really understanding this whole incident is that Mark Hoffman had his agency and he used it very unwisely and it led to some harmful ramifications, but the church leaders worked the best they could with the information that they had and trusted the experts on issues, which is something that I I still see happening today too, um, as new historical things develop. And I think there's a, a real key principle we can learn from all of this, and that is Sometimes people act precipitously based on new discoveries. I think what's most important is for people to consider history as being like a giant jigsaw puzzle on the wall. And as you study it, you put all these pieces up on the wall. And if suddenly a piece comes up that doesn't seem to fit in the puzzle, you know, put it in where you think it fits best, but there is a real possibility it doesn't fit in the puzzle. And that was the case with Hoffman's forgeries. You know, people put it up on the board. And if you were a person who overreacted to that kind of thing, yeah, it it did something to you. Uh, and Hoffman, I think, is going to be responsible for what he did to people who reacted in that way. But my counsel to people is don't overreact when it comes to new discoveries for or against the church, for or against American history, for or against world history, whatever it is you're interested in. Just consider the totality of the evidence, to borrow a, a phrase that uh, lawyers often use, and Look to see whether the new evidence fits comfortably in with everything else. Uh, If it does, it may still be a forgery, but uh, it's not going to change the the overall perspective. Um, If I mean the Anton transcript, when it was finally discovered to be a forgery, didn't change, you know, the story very much. The discovery of the Salamander letter being a forgery that did, you know, cause people to toss out that forgery because it was dramatically different from the rest of the evidence. You, you already talked about this a little bit, but I, I think it's important to talk about a little bit more. How can church members better respond to history? And how do you think that this incident has shifted the way that the church both institutionally and as individual members of the church should approach history? Well, first of all, I think the most important thing people can do with history is to learn it. I think our biggest problem is we don't have enough people who know church history very well. They know a very little bit of it. And they've relied on others to spoon feed them what they know. When I was a youth, I reached out on my own, began doing my own study and research and so forth. And what I learned is that you get a very basic account in primary and in Sunday school. If you want more than that, it's up to you to learn more. The sources are available. um, And so just go out and begin learning more. And I think the more you learn, the more puzzle pieces you have on the wall and you can see things in perspective. So learn a lot, you know, study it in great detail. And during my tenure, almost uh, three and a half decades in at church headquarters as the managing director of the church historical department, the family history department, the public affairs department, communications department, we went to great efforts to make available to members of the church historical information in an unprecedented sort of way. And now as a church member in your pajamas and stocking feet in the middle of the night, you can log on to the church history library's catalog and go from the catalog to digital images of things and look them up. I mean, there's more material. If you spent your entire life from now until the end, you wouldn't be able to read all the material we've made available to you online. There's simply not enough time. We've made so much available to people. Wonderful material that wasn't accessible in the past. The Joseph Smith papers are are just one good example of that. So learn it well. And when you find something that seems to be different from what you've understood in the past, put it up on the wall with the rest of the puzzle piece and keep it all in perspective. Don't bring it up close to your eye where it's blinding you to everything else that's going on. Don't get myopic about it. I love that answer. And I think that's really true too. The church's online archive, is extremely extensive. I use it in my own research for both school and work, and it's been a great blessing for for me in that way to have so much information available. And I think that goes back to an earlier question that I asked you, is the church hiding documents? 
they're putting them all up online. So I would say that it would be pretty hard for them to hide if that's what they're doing. Well, I mean, all, all institutions have information that they can't make available for legal or ethical reasons. I mean, there's privacy law that prevents the church from making accessible, for example, your tithing records. Uh, that prevents the church, their ethical reasons and legal reasons from making available. Suppose uh, you go in and talk to a, a church leader and have a private conversation with them and they happen to make notes about that. They are legally and ethically prevented from making that information available. So there are some things that are held back. But during my tenure as the person responsible for the entire church history operation, I said to, to our people, and this remains the case today, make everything accessible that we possibly can. That's the default mode. Make it accessible. Then if there's a legal or ethical reason why we can't, okay, that'll be an exception, not the rule. That makes perfect sense. So I wanted to just wrap this up. Um, by you bearing your testimony of the church. That's been something that I like to do on the podcast. And also by you just sharing kind of some cumulative thoughts that you would say to someone who has just watched this documentary and doesn't know where to go from here, doesn't know where to look for sources, doesn't know how to approach this issue. So for this particular issue, again, I recommend my book, Victims, the LDS Church and the Mark Hoffman case. There's also been a recent statement uh, put, put online by the church history department about the Hoffman forgeries. You can look that up online. Uh, I, I'd recommend you go to those two sources as a starting point. And then if you want, if you want more, you, know, you can follow my footnotes to, to other types of materials. I think my book is the only one that provides footnotes. So it, it's the one that can guide you into the original sources. In terms of my own personal feelings of, of belief, I studied the church's history in great detail from the time of about age 15 on. By the time I graduated from high school, I knew more about church history than 99% of church members know today. I had encountered a, a anti-Mormon literature during that time. I had been introduced to you know, all of the sort of uh, things that people want to spring on you to surprise you about church history. Ultimately, I've come to write about many of those things. I think the most difficult subject in church history is the Mount Meadows Massacre. I've written or edited four books on that subject and have a fifth one that will be submitted to Oxford University Press probably later this year. So I went, and I went to the furthest extremes to research you know, the things that I thought were the most difficult. Um, and with all of that, I had the remarkable experience at age 29 of, being, of leaving what I was doing professionally and being asked to head the church history department. Imagine, if you will, you're 29 years old and someone comes to you, gives you all the keys and combinations and says you're in charge of everything. You can access any event anytime you want. I mean, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, I could walk in and pick up Joseph Smith's journals or the Book of Mormon original manuscript or Joseph Smith's revelations or anything else I wanted and sit down and read it in, in the privacy of my own office. Um, I had that opportunity for three decades to learn church history firsthand. And what did it do to my strong testimony that I brought with me to all of this? It reinforced it. Did I learn that people were human? Sure. Is that a surprise that people are human? <laughs> is it a surprise that that's all God has to work with is humans and that they have, you know, failings and make mistakes and faults mm -hmm. and so forth? Sure. I learned about people's failings and mistakes, but it didn't change the fundamentals that led to my testimony. So after three decades of being in the midst of all that material and seeing all of it, it reinforced my feelings of belief in the church. So that's the testimony I, I leave with, with your listeners. Thanks so much. And thank you for coming on. It was so great to hear your perspective and to learn from you. And I look up to you a lot and I know, I know our listeners do too. So thank you for taking the time. Remember, just dig into it. Okay, folks, don't, don't rely on what you're spoon fed. Get into it yourself and look for the big picture. Don't get thrown off by little puzzle pieces that you can't understand. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you.